Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, and I'm excited today to do an endocrine video with you. I've had uh, people asking me for endocrine videos in the past, and so today I'm going to do, basically I'm going to do knowledge questions with you, and then I'm going to teach while I do the questions, rather than just doing like a lecture on the endocrine system, because it's not the most exciting system to lecture on. So the organs of the endocrine system, not sure if I can remember them all, but we've got the pituitary, which is in the head. Um, I think it's the thalamus. And then we have the thyroid, which is here in the neck, the parathyroid, which is right next to the thyroid, the pancreas, which secretes insulin, um, the adrenals, which secrete steroid hormones, and then the ovaries and the testes and the kidneys actually are also, uh, they're, they're dual labeled as, because they do release some hormones and they also uh, release other, and they also are obviously in the renal system as well. So they're kind of dual labeled. All right. Uh, remember, Clinic Reviews also does NCLEX reviews. So if you're getting ready to take your NCLEX and you feel like you need some help, go ahead and sign up for a Clinic Review at clinicreviews.com. Okay, let's get started. A client with diabetes mellitus is admitted to the hospital with hyperglycemia. The nurse should anticipate which hormone to be administered to lower the blood glucose levels. So I basically am put this here just to make sure you know, insulin is considered a hormone. Anything that is secreted by an endocrine organ is considered a hormone other than the kidneys. The kidneys do secrete some hormones. That's why it's sort of part of the endocrine system. But um, for the most part, the things that are secreted by the endocrine organs are considered hormones. So just, I just don't want you to be confused by that label of insulin as a hormone. A client is diagnosed with hyperthyroidism, which assessment findings should the nurse anticipate? So we're always most concerned about unexpected findings. So you have to know what is expected. So you know what not to be as concerned about. So the thyroid, like I said, it's right here in the neck, right behind the trachea. You can sort of feel it if you palpate in your neck. It's got two lobes. And it does release the thyroid hormone. And you should think of it sort of as, as an engine. Think of it as a fast running engine. Rum, 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 rum. Like you're in neutral or you're in park. And you're like uh, revving your engine. Like think of it like that. And or if, if you're in park and you're letting it idle just really slowly. So that's hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. So if you think of a fast revving engine, it's going to get warm right? So body temperature goes up, it's going to run faster. So heart rate goes up and blood pressure goes up. And it also uses up a lot of gasoline that you don't need to be using because you're just sitting there. So it uses up a lot of energy and it's going to require more gasoline. So it's going to require more, a person who's hyperthyroid is going to feel hungry and they're going to lose weight. Um, so they're going to be slender and they have a lot of energy, sometimes nervous energy. So that's hyperthyroidism. And then hypothyroidism is the ob opposite, right? So people don't have a lot of energy. They don't feel hungry, but they still gain weight. Uh, they have cold, they feel cold all the time because their, their uh, uh, body temperature is lower. Their heart rate is lower. Their blood pressure is lower. Okay. So those are, th that's hypothyroidism, a slow running engine versus a fast running engine. Now, the other thing uh, that everyone sort of knows is a symptom of hyperthyroidism is exophthalmos. So that's the fast running engine. And I'm sure there's a pathological reason why this happens. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Um, that's the bulging of the eyes. That's exophthalmos. So that, that's associated with hyperthyroidism. Now, they could have just as easily said the client is diagnosed with Graves' disease. Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism. And you would have to know Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism. The answer would have been the same. So uh, you should know that Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism. The nurse is providing discharge instructions to a client with Addison's disease, which statement by the client indicates a need for further teaching. Further teaching means we're looking for the false statement. So F goes with F, further goes with false. So we're looking for the false statement. And Addison's disease is in a disease of the adrenals, the adrenal cortex. These are, there's two of them. They're located just on top of the kidneys and they secrete stress hormones. Stress hormones are things like glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and they also can stimulate the, the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So Addison's disease means it's not secreting enough stress hormones. So stress hormones are not being secreted. So people have a poor 
stress response. Okay. So how do you think we would treat Addison's disease? If they're not secreting stress hormones, how would we treat it? Well, we don't give epinephrine. We give steroids. Okay. So we give particularly glucocorticoids. So that's what we give to treat Addison. So we're looking for a false statement as it relates to discharge teaching in Addison's. Okay. I will carry, I will carry an emergency injection of hydrocortisone. Well, hydrocortisone is a steroid. And if they have a poor stress response, they could actually pass out. And, and one of the things, if people pass out, like at a, ba a baseball game, maybe you're in church, uh, maybe you're in the mall, so somebody all of a sudden passes out. Um, one of the things to consider is maybe they have Addison's disease and they, that's why they have to carry an emergency injection of hydrocortisone because they may need to get that injection. So that's a true statement. I should monitor my weight daily and report any sudden weight gain. Well, why would that be a true statement? Because we're going to treat Addison's with steroids. What is a side effect of steroids? Weight gain. So it's, we're not so much concerned about weight gain. We know they could gain some weight, but sudden weight gain is something to be concerned about. So that's a true statement. They would need to monitor their daily weight and report any sudden weight gain. I will increase my salt intake to prevent dehydration. No, we don't ever tell people to in increase their salt intake. There's no reason for that. Plus, um, I do think, um, so no, we don't ever tell anybody to increase their salt intake. That's, that's not a good NCLEX answer. So false. D, I will wear a medical alert bracelet at all times. Well, that's absolutely true because if they pass out and they need to get their emergency injection of hydrocortisone, somebody needs to know that. So they need to wear that medical alert bracelet. So C is the false statement as it relates to Addison's disease, which is under secretion of the adrenal cortex. All right, question four. A client with hypothyroidism is prescribed levothyroxine, which is Synthroid. So that would be if they're low thyroid, then we need to give them thyroid. Which assessment finding should the nurse monitor for as a potential indication of medication effectiveness? Well, we talked about a fast revving engine, right? So they have a lot of energy. Well, if we have a slow running engine, they're going to have low levels of energy. So an indication that the Synthroid is working would be increased energy levels. Now, what about slowed heart rate? Well, no, if you have a slow running engine, your heart rate is already slow. So we actually would expect to see the heart rate start to go up when you start on Synthroid. Weight loss. Um, when you start on Synthroid? Well, I suppose it could be, but that's not an indication of effectiveness. I mean, they could lose weight, but that that's not what we use to say it's effective. It's really, it's the energy levels that, that tell us the medication is effective. Improved vision, that has nothing to do with it. So the correct answer is increased energy levels as an indication of medication effectiveness. The nurse is assessing a client with Cushing's syndrome. Which findings should the nurse expect? So Cushing's syndrome is over secretion of the adrenal cortex and the adrenal cortex secretes steroids. So if you think about what are the, think about the same thing as the side effects of steroids. Okay. So let's, let's just talk about this. Can steroids cause amenorrhea? Increased use of steroids cause amenorrhea? Yes, it can. Can it cause hypotension? No, it actually causes hypertension. Does the use of steroids increase bone density? No, it decreases bone density. Does the use of steroids cause weight gain? Yes, we just talked about that in the previous question. Can the use of steroids cause moon-shaped face? Yes. Can the use of steroids cause bradycardia? No, it causes increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. Can the use of steroids cause striae? Now, this is a vocabulary word. You should know what it means. It, it, it means stretch marks, stretch marks. And yes, it can. Use of steroids can cause stretch marks. Hirsutism. Hirsutism is facial hair on women. Can it cause facial hair on women? Yes, it can. So assessment findings that a nurse should look for with Cushing syndrome are the same as the side effects of someone who's taking steroids. So they're the same symptoms. A client is admitted with syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? So this is a first question. So we may find more than one answer that we like, but we want to know what we're going to do first. All right. So SIADH, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, antidiuresis, antidiuresis, diuresis means losing fluid. If it's antidiuresis, we're retraining fluid. So you can think of SIADH as adding fluid. Okay. We add fluid. So they're fluid volume overloaded. 
All right. So let's think about this. Administer IV normal saline. Absolutely not. They're fluid volume overloaded. We're not going to do it. Monitor intake and output hourly. Mm, we don't usually monitor intake and output hourly. We usually do it every shift. And so it, unless there's a specific reason that they tell me they're really unstable, I wouldn't think that we would do that. So I'm going to put a question mark next to it. If I hate all the other answers, I can pick it, but I don't like it. C, place the client on fluid restriction. Well, they're fluid volume overloaded. So I like C. That's a fast, easy thing to do. We know we're going to have to put them on a fluid restriction. So absolutely. Administer vasopressin antagonist medication. All right. Well, I don't know if that's what I'm supposed to do. Since I don't know if I'm supposed to do that, I do know I should do C. Absolutely. So I'm going to pick C. Okay. So if you're like, I don't know, well, then pick the one you know. Remember, I've told you many times. Pick the answer you know, not the answer you don't know. A client with diabetes insipidus is prescribed desmopressin, which instruction should the nurse include in the teaching plan? So diabetes insipidus is dehydration. So it's diuresis. So think of diabetes mellitus is an insulin problem, right? It's, a, it's an insulin problem. Whereas diabetes insipidus is a dehydration problem. So the D in diabetes goes with diuresis and dehydration. Okay, so we have um, fluid volume loss and we're dehydrated. They're probably already dehydrated. So which instruction should the nurse include in the teaching plan? Increased dietary intake of sodium. I never do that. Y'all, I never pick that as the right answer. So I'm not gonna pick it here either. Monitor blood glucose levels regularly. Well, it is diabetes. So I'm gonna put a question mark next to that and say that might be the right answer. Limit fluid intake during therapy. Well, they're already dehydrated, so I'm not gonna limit fluid intake. So that's off. So A and C are off. Administer the medication intramuscularly. Actually, I don't know how it's given. So monitor blood glucose levels regularly. Let's go back to that one. Is there a reason why we would want to monitor blood glucose levels regularly? Well, desmopressin actually is acts like antidiuretic hormone. And uh, antidiuretic hormone can cause hyperglycemia. So if we give desmopressin, it can also cause hyperglycemia. So which is part of the reason we call this diabetes insipidus. So it's not diabetes mellitus, it's diabetes insipidus. But since it's a diabetes, I am going to pick that one. That one makes the most sense to me. And that is the correct answer. Eight, a client is admitted to the hospital with a suspected pheochromocytoma, which assessment findings should the nurse anticipate? So I'm doing this one to teach you a vocabulary word, pheochromocytoma. This is not a word that I can figure out what it means by breaking it down. Like if I go, okay, what does pheo mean, chromo mean, cytoma mean? I don't know. It doesn't help me at all. So I'm going to tell you what it is. It's actually a disease of the adrenals where it stimulates the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Okay, epinephrine and norepinephrine are secreted, pheochromocytoma. So unless you work on an endocrine floor or you work for an endocrinologist, you're probably never going to see pheochromocytoma. So this is the kind of thing that you learn for the NCLEX. So I do recommend learning it for the NCLEX, okay? So pheochromocytoma stimulates, is a, a disease of the adrenals and it stimulates the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. So we know epinephrine is a part of the sympathetic nervous system, which is fight or flight. So it should increase heart rate and blood pressure, right? So hypotension, no. Bradycardia, no. Epigastric pain, mm, not that I know of. Hypertension and tachycardia, absolutely. Theochromocytoma stimulates the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which causes hypertension and tachycardia. All right, a client is admitted with hyperparathyroidism. Which of the fine lab values will the nurse watch for? So hyperparathyroidism, the thi parathyroid is right next to the, the thyroid. And one of the things they could ask you actually about hypoparathyroid is often when they do a thyroidectomy, when they remove the thyroid, they accidentally remove the parathyroid along with it. And the parathyroid controls calcium. So if you do a thigh, if they do a total thyroidectomy and they accidentally remove the parathyroid, the person's going to be have low calcium low calcium. 
So this is a question about hyperparathyroidism. So we know if you lose the parathyroid, you're going to have low calcium. So if they're hyperparathyroid, what do you think is going to happen to the calcium level? Well, it's actually going to go high. So what happens is the, the, the hormones that's released by the parathyroid stimulates the reabsorption of calcium somewhere in the, I don't know, proximal convoluted tubule. <laughs> I don't know where, somewhere in the kidney, right? It stimulates the, the reabsorption of calcium and it actually stimulates the, the um, excretion of phosphate. So when you're hyperparathyroid, hyperparathyroid, they're going to have high calcium and low phosphate and it doesn't have any effect on sodium. So you, that's just something you need to, you need to remember. And hypoparathyroid is going to be hypocalcemia. Okay, hypocalcemia. And it would be important to remember that calcium does the opposite of the prefix. So hypocalcemia causes increased neuromuscular irritability, increased neuromuscular irritability. So if you get a question, say, about hypoparathyroidism, and they say, what symptom would you report to the healthcare provider? What symptom? I would be looking, if they're hypoparathyroid, I would be looking for serious neuromuscular problems like tetany. Tetany is a, is a serious, now they, they have a little bit of paresthesia. Okay, paresthesia is a mild neuromuscular uh, symptom, very mild. And I would expect paresthesia with hypoparathyroidism because the the calcium level is going to go down. So I'm going to have some paresthesia, but I wouldn't expect tetany. That's a very serious, very serious neuromuscular symptom. So I would need to report that to the healthcare provider. All right. Well, this was just kind of testing your knowledge. I hope it was helpful and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.